Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we'll be focusing on a new book. It's available in e-form, and the paper version will be out momentarily, published by Johns Hopkins University Press Professor, University Professor uh, Mary E. Cerati, entitled Not One Inch, America, Russia, and the Making of a Post-Cold War Stalemate, published by Yale University Press. And joining us this afternoon are three discussants, Serhi Plucky of Harvard, Jennifer Siegel of Ohio State, and Heidi Torek of the University of British Columbia. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my colleague, Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Center. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, we have been meeting weekly, usually, if not always on Mondays, in pre-COVID time in person at the Wilson Center since pandemic restrictions here in the virtual realm. And today's session, I should note, is also being co-sponsored by the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute. Behind the scenes are a number of people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And we'd like to thank our institutional supporters, in particular the George Washington University Department of History, as well as a number of anonymous donors. And as we say every week, we sincerely invite you to join their ranks. On the logistics front, please note today's session is being recorded and will soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function. That is our preferred method. That way you get to uh, answer the question, ask the question, uh, or the Q&A function on Zoom. That way we get to read the question. Um, we'll call on as many folks as we can. And with that, I turn over the screen to Christian Osterman, who will be moderating today's session. Christian, Zoom room, all yours. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, it gives me real pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon, Mary Serrati, who is the Cravis Professor at Johns Hopkins University, a researcher at Harvard Center for European Studies, and a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. She earned her AB at Harvard and a PhD in history at Yale. Her books include, her many books include the Collapse, the Accidental Opening of the Berlin Wall, listed as a best book of 2014 by The Economist and The Financial Times. That's right, you're, you're holding it up there. And 1989, The Struggle to Create Post-Cold War Europe, a Financial Times best book of 2009. Mary is really well prepared today. And of course, she is now the author of Not One Inch, America, Russia, and the Making of Post-Cold War Stalemate. Mary, the Zoom room is all yours. Congratulations. And um, uh, yes, you're, you've got the mic. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be invited and uh, for you uh, giving me a chance to hawk not one, not two, but three books. Uh, because this book that I've just written, Not One Inch, and I, you'll notice I didn't hold that up because unfortunately the supply chain shortage has hit home. The, uh, the book was supposed to be in, in warehouses in October and already shipping now, but apparently it arrived in the warehouse this weekend and it is shipping. So please order, it'll be there soon and there are eBooks available. And this book, Not One Inch, it turned out to be the third book in a loose trilogy that even I didn't know I was writing. The origins of this book go back to 1989 when I was studying abroad in West Berlin and witnessed truly remarkable scenes that year. In fact, those scenes were the end of my not very promising pre-med career and the beginning of my only marginally more promising historical career. And I worked as a journalist for a couple of years after that, but then I realized I wanted to understand in a deeper way what I had witnessed. And so I decided to get PhD in history at Yale. And I started already as a graduate student in the 90s, doing interviews and working in all these fantastic new sources, such as the East German secret police or Stasi sources. And I did also interviews with actors and events. And I worked in other Warsaw Pact sources. And gradually I realized that my familiarity with, that, with those sources would help me to get Western sources declassified. Because in, in the West, documents are generally held closed for 25 or 30 or 40 years. 
And when I had Eastern sources, it helped me know what to ask for in the Western collections. The Warsaw Pact sources were, of course, also kept secret. But when the Warsaw Pact states, East Germany collapsed and the Warsaw Pact ceased to exist, there was nobody to keep those archives locked up. So scholars such as myself got access to them. So over the course of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, I wrote the two books that Christian was kind enough to mention. I, I wanted to understand how the Berlin Wall came down. So I wrote The Collapse, The Accidental Opening of the Berlin Wall. And I wanted to understand how Germany unified. And so I wrote 1989, The Struggle to Create Post-Cold War Europe. But I realized in the course of researching those books that I, I still wasn't done with the topic because I'd come across evidence on the early origins of NATO expansion. And as the news about relations between the United States, my country, and Russia seemed to get worse day by day, particularly in 2016, when the news about hacking of elections came out, I realized I, I, there were more questions I needed to answer for myself. I wanted to understand what went wrong between the US and Russia. And I realized that story was related to the end of the Cold War. And so I decided to write this book, Not One Inch, America, Russia, and the Making of Post-Cold War Stalemate. And you're going to hear a lot of details about this today from me and from the wonderful commentators who I'm, I'm really pleased have joined us. But before we dive into the details, I'd like to take a minute and give you a kind of big picture overview of the book. And by way of explanation, my reason for doing this is that during the pandemic, my book about the wall coming down, the collapse, was optioned by a TV producer for production as a limited TV series, something along the lines of the Chernobyl series about which Professor Plokey has written so movingly. Now, I hasten to add, don't hold your breath to see it on the screen. I apparently, uh, the fact that my book has been optioned means that instead of a one in a million chance of it becoming a TV series, I have a one in a thousand chance of it becoming a TV series. So watch this space for further announcements about the TV series. But the reason I mention it is that this process of having my book optioned meant that I've gotten into contact with television producers and screenwriters. And so the, the screenwriter who will be doing the show if it's purchased by a, a, a major channel or studio I got to know him and talk to him about what it means to be a screenwriter, meaning that he lives entirely from his income from his writing. He doesn't have a professorial appointment such as I have. In other words, if my book doesn't sell, if you all don't buy not one inch, the, the, the lights will still go on in my, in my house. I will still get a paycheck. But for him, he has to sell writing in order to keep the lights on at his house. And so he said to me, you know, when I'm presenting a project or pitching a project, he said, I don't start with the details. I start with the emotional core of why it matters. And I thought, huh, that's an interesting approach. Why, what is the emotional core here? Why am I going through all these details of US-Russian diplomacy, interaction, of the expansion of NATO? Why am I doing that? And I realized it was because Cold Wars are not short-lived affairs. So thaws are precious. And neither the US nor Russia made the best opportunity of the thaw in the 1990s. The, the West and Russia found itself delivered from the thermonuclear standoff that had cast such a long shadow over all of our childhoods. And somehow things have gone wrong. And so if I had to come up with one sort of emotional image, which is what the screenwriter recommended, th this would be it. So imagine that you're swimming in the ocean and you've been carried out in a riptide. And you find a log to grab on that you think is your deliverance. This book is about the moment deliverance slips away. This is, book is about a time when it seemed things were going right in the 1990s, but when you actually look really closely at it on the basis of evidence, interviews, you start to see the origins of what is going wrong. And so a big part of that story is this fight over NATO expansion. As I make clear in the book, it's not the only part of the story. As a historian, the one phenomenon that I've, I've never observed is monocausality. Important events don't happen for just one reason. They happen for multiple reasons. So this is part of a broader story, but it's an important part of the story. And let me explain a little bit more about the title too, because it helps explain why it's important. The three words, not one inch, those are, of course, infamous, infamous words. The fight over NATO's future, sorry, the fight over Europe's future beyond the Cold War entered into its decisive phase with these three words. They were spoken in February 1990 by the American Secretary of State James Baker to Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the leader of the Soviet Union. 
The Berlin Wall's collapse on November 9th, 1989 had, of course, by then gravely weakened Moscow's grip on Central Europe. But thanks to the Soviet victory over the Nazis in World War II, decades later, in the 80s and into the 90s, uh, Moscow still had hundreds of thousands of troops in East Germany and the legal right to keep them there. To convince Gorbachev to relinquish that military and legal might, Baker had uttered these three words as part of a hypothetical bargain. Roughly speaking, what if you, Mikhail, let your part of Germany go and we agree that NATO will not shift one inch eastward from its present position? A controversy erupted over this exchange almost immediately, at first behind closed doors, but then publicly. But more important, I realized, was the decade to follow, the 1990s, when those three words took on nearly the opposite meaning. Gorbachev did let his part of Germany go, but after the Soviet Union's collapse 30 years ago this fall, in December 1991, Washington rethought its options. Washington realized it could not only win big, but win bigger. Not one inch of territory need be off limits to NATO. So in other words, instead of NATO moving not one inch eastwards, not one inch turned into not one inch of territory needs to be off limits. And the story of the book is the story of that arc of, of change from one meaning of not one inch to another, which is why I decided to use it as the title of the book. And the consequence of that, I argue, is the stalemate that we have today is, is the, the loss of that moment of optimism at the end of the Cold War. In other words, between the fall of the wall and the rise of Putin, animosity between Moscow and Washington over NATO's future became central to the making of a post-Cold War political order that looked much like its Cold War predecessor and to the unmaking of optimistic hopes for cooperation from Vancouver to Vladivostok. Now, to show how this happens in the book, I examine this conflict over NATO expansion between Russia and America against the sprawling, unpredictable landscape of the 1990s. I'm, I'm, this is a, a serious historical assessment of the 1990s, and the 1990s are an amazing decade. There is a lot going on. That decade witnessed the astonishing overnight collapse of an empire about which Sergei Ploky has written, yielding a host of new Eurasian states. The decade produced visionary leaders, some rising from prisons to presidencies, gaining Nobel Prizes and global admiration. That decade redefined the realm of the possible for democratization, disarmament, market economies, and the tenets of liberal international order. But that decade also opened the door to new forms of authoritarianism, de-democratization, and ethnic cleansing. So in order to tell the story of the 90s, it is essential to narrativize them. You have to turn the 90s into a narrative. Otherwise, your chances of getting from the beginning to the end of characters, states, capitals, developments approaches zero. And so, as I've been saying, I decided to make the through line through the 90s, the fight between the United States and Washington over NATO expansion. Now, if there's budding young scholars in the audience, I could imagine other through lines. I could see a book on the 90s where the through line is the expansion of the European Union or lack thereof. I could see a book on the 90s where the through line is the spread of neoliberalism. And Philip Tehr has already done some work in this area. I could see a book where the through line is the violence in the Balkans. So this isn't the only through line, but this is the through line that I chose to use. And I chose this through line partly because I'm interested in the history, but partly because it isn't history. To this day, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, cites these events as justification for actions he is taking now. In other words, this isn't just past. This is very much present and controversial, this story. In particular, the uh, Putin and people around him say that the West absolutely betrayed Russia, and that justifies what he's doing. After, for example, in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea, Putin gave a speech at the Kremlin where he explicitly said he was justified in doing what he did because NATO had expanded. So this story is both historically important and also important in current terms. And I thought where I could add value was by trying to create a shared narrative. In other words, trying to establish in an empirical way the sequence of events. Now, we may not agree about what they mean. I, I, I'm under no illusions that this contentious debate is suddenly going to go away. But I believe as a scholar, I can add value, as I said, by establishing a shared narrative. And so the book has over 1,800 footnotes. Now, if you're not an academic and you don't love footnotes, uh, it is not necessary to read them. You do not need to read a single footnote. You can just read the story of the book this arc 
of uh, from cooperation to confrontation without looking at the endnotes. But if you're interested in all those sources that I got declassified and you want to see how I constructed the story, then you can dive deeply into the endnotes. Because for this book, what I did is I built on the research I did for the previous two books by focusing on getting more documents declassified in the United States, particularly from the Clinton Presidential Library. Once I realized I wanted to take the story forward to through the rise of Putin and through the actual beginning of NATO expansion, I realized I was going to need documents coming forward into this century. So I filed a huge number of requests with the Clinton Library in 2015. And when those did not succeed, I went through an appeals process, which took three years. And in 2018, that appeals process succeeded. And as part of that, I got nearly all transcripts of summits between Bill Clinton and Boris Yeltsin released, and a host of other documents associated with those summits. As a matter of fact, it was such a big release that the Kremlin complained. I was really amazed to hear that Peskov, Putin's spokesman, complained that the Clinton Library had released documents about currently serving politicians, by which he meant above all his current boss, Putin, because of course, Putin was working under Yeltsin for many of these years. First, he was serving as the KGB agent in East Germany, and then he was working under Putin, among other things, as prime minister. So Putin is all over these documents. And so Peskov complained that the Clinton Library had released documents on currently serving politicians, meaning his boss. And I thought that's rich because if you can't release documents on currently serving politicians, then there will never be any documents released on Putin because as far as I can tell, he's going to be in office for all of his natural life. And I also figured I must be doing something right if the Kremlin was complaining about my document release. So I used these documents, I used interviews, I did over 100 interviews for this book as well. And as I said, there's over 1,800 footnotes. So if you want to see how I constructed the story, you can do that. But if you just want to understand what the narrative is, the sequence of events, then you can just read the book. And in the book, I talk about how NATO expansion was obviously a success. Today, NATO stretches from North America, Iceland, and Greenland to the United Kingdom, Europe, and the Baltics, and it covers nearly a billion people. The NATO alliance covers nearly a billion people. Its members all possess the so-called Article 5 guarantee, a promise rooted in the alliance's founding treaty that, quote, an armed attack against one or more of them shall be considered an attack against them all. That is a very, very strong military guarantee. And since gaining that guarantee, the new members of the alliance have indeed remained free from large-scale armed attacks, even as for fighting began against some former Soviet borders. And American military might and its deterrent power remain the cornerstone of the alliance's strength. And those countries were, were justified in asking to join NATO. They were new sovereign nations. They had thrown off Soviet oppression. It was a justifiable reaction to the end of the Cold War. But what I show in my book is that NATO's success came at a price. It is no small thing to guarantee the security of a billion people. In the 1990s, Washington was so focused on achieving eastward expansion of Article 5 that Washington did not sufficiently consider the consequences of how it achieved that goal. So, In other words, my book is not an anti-expansion book. There are anti-expansion books. It's not an anti-expansion book. I see NATO expansion as a reasonable response to what was happening. After all, NATO had expanded during the Cold War, so it was neither unprecedented nor unreasonable to do so again. The problem was that the problem was how it happened. The way NATO expanded happened in a way that maximized Moscow's aggravation and did maximum damage to the newfound cooperation between Washington and Moscow. The fall of the wall in 1989 had briefly created the potential for a newly cooperative post-Cold War order. But a decade later, the border between NATO and non-NATO Europe remained a clearly demarcated front line. Importantly, Ukraine and other post-Soviet states languished in a gray zone, nuclear competition was renewing, and early hopes for cooperation had waned. The, as I said, the Cold War thaw was starting to fade. We did not cherish it enough, and now, of course, it is gone. And the manner of enlargement, how it happened, had contributed to that outcome.
So I could, of course, keep talking for hours because I've just written this big book about this, but I'm going to rein myself in and stop there because I'm really very, very honored that uh, Sarah, Heidi, and Jenny have joined us. And I'm really eager to hear what questions they have. And then I'm also, of course, um, touched that there's a huge number of people here. And I, I see a number of names of friends and experts in the participant list. So I'm looking forward to hearing your questions as well. So thank you again for inviting me. And I look forward to our discussion. Thanks so much, Mary. Great. Uh, we have um, uh, the real, a real privilege in having three wonderful commentators for this session. And we'll start with uh, Serhi Plochi, who, like Mary, is also a veteran uh, of the Washington History Seminar, uh, and has spoken here about his own books, but also um, uh, uh, commented uh, frequently on other um, presentations. Serhi Plochi is the Mikhailo Khrushchevsky Professor of Ukrainian History and the Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University, a leading authority on Eastern Europe and Russia. He has published extensively on the international history of the Cold War. His books won numerous awards, including the Lionel Gelber Prize for the best English language book on the, on the international relations for The Last Empire, The Final Days of the Soviet Union, published in 2014. Uh, it won the, the, the Taras, uh, he won the Taras Shevchenko National Prize of Ukraine for The Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine, published in 2015, and the Bailey Gifford Prize and Pushkin House Book Prize uh, of the UK for Chernobyl, History of a Tragedy, published in 2018. His latest book, Nuclear Folly, A History of the Cuban Missile Crisis, was released in April 2021. Uh, we're delighted to have Serhi back as an alumnus of the Wilson Center. And Serhi, thank you for joining us today. Welcome back to the Washington History Seminar. The Zoom room is all yours now. Uh, thank you very much, Christian, for this uh, generous introduction. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, to Mary Sorotti, huge congratulations. Uh, this is a very important book. Uh, maybe it's strange to say those words even before the book is, was released, but I am not exaggerating one inch. It is an it is important book, and if there was once a pioneering book, the pioneering is probably the key, the key definition of that book, because Mary really opens for us historians of international relations of Cold War and post-Cold War era, uh, an entire new decade by uh, getting numerous, numerous documents, mostly through FOIA, many of them, which were not read before her, were not accessible before her. And uh, whatever uh, will follow in terms of historiography on that particular period, one way or another, will be based on uh, Mary's discoveries and will uh, function certainly in some form of, di of a dialogue with that systematization of the documents that uh, she produced and the hypotheses and the approaches that she put forward in her book. Uh, of course, uh, and Mary quotes there in her book that all history is contemporary in a sense that it is written from the perspective of our today. And um, I certainly read this book from the perspective of what is happening today in Europe and in Eastern Europe in particular, the continuing war in Ukraine that is going there and was looking for the, uh, for the um, uh, maybe the beginnings, the signs of that, of that conflict coming or the decisions that were made at that time, either contributing or not contributing in one way or another to contemporary developments. But I also read this book as a historian and made a lot of discoveries for myself. And one of them, the first one was this determination of President uh, um, uh, George H.W. Bush, determination not just only to keep NATO, but also to expand NATO. And for me, that was, uh, that was really part of the solution of a puzzle that I had myself and I was working on the book on the fall of the Soviet Union, where Bush is certainly the president who refuses to dance on the Berlin Wall, and that's, that's something that his closest advisors hold against him. But in this, in this story, it's very clearly, very clear that Bush is not just um, somehow ending the Cold War together with Gorbachev or in cooperation with Gorbachev, but he is winning the Cold War. 
And his, his trophy is really NATO and the possibility to expand NATO. Again, not, not as deep into East Europe as it happened, but certainly, certainly uh, integrating, integrating Central Europe. And again, that, that is, uh, at least for, from my perspective, a very important contribution and addition to the, to the image of the President Bush, but also to the American policy uh, in, the, uh, in Europe at that time. Uh, another uh, surprise for me and, and, and discovery was the importance of Ukraine uh, during the first uh, half of the decade of the 1990s, how much time uh, the uh, decision makers in Washington in particular spent uh, looking at Ukraine, dealing with Ukraine, trying to accommodate the security dilemma that emerged at that time. And I read that, that interest in Ukraine actually in broader a little bit, in a sense of importance of the post-Soviet space in general for the uh, American-Russian relations uh, of the 1990s. And uh, I don't know whether, whether Mary would agree with me or not, but I would actually uh, place that, that uh, particular space, geopolitical space, post-Soviet space, in terms of its importance, I would put it actually ahead of the traditional Eastern Europe, of Visegrad III. It seems to me that a core of the both cooperation, but also break of that cooperation in the 1990s is mostly about the future of the post-Soviet space. The Cold War ended either in 1899, 90 or 91. There are different, different interpretations. It ended, it looks like all over the world, from Afghanistan to Cuba. But one place where the uh, two uh, former superpowers or one superpower and one declining uh, great power, one area where they failed to agree was the future of the post-Soviet space. And, and I think that again, uh, in terms of the, of the discussions about NATO, it's the post-Soviet space where the main tensions, where, where the, 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 the not just occur, but where the, the conflict occurs, not, not, not only tensions. Uh, another another uh, extremely important, uh, important contribution is looking again, mostly at this point through the American eyes, at the relations with Russia uh, in the 1990s. And uh, uh, Mary, like, like many before her, asked this question about whether that was a moment when the possibility to create foundations for a new post-Cold War world actually were there, and that was the opportunity that was missed. And this is, this is uh, again, very, very interesting question, important question, but again, I would, I would like to, to suggest maybe an alternative interpretation, and I would certainly love to, 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 to hear what, what Mary and, and other participants on the panel have to say about that. Because my reading of the situation is that during the first half of the 1990s, we have a moment where Russian and American interests overall, but also in the region coincide. They work together there, and those interests include, of course, on the part of Yeltsin and the Russian Federation to acquire sovereignty in relation, first of all, to Gorbachev's Soviet Union. The, Yeltsin tries hard to get, to get Bush on his side, so the relations don't start, the relations start with tension. But then they progress to a degree that Russia is very much interested in the American support in terms of um, really uh, recognizing its sovereignty as an independent state, recognizing its special status in that sphere as a member of the Security Council of the United Nations, which depended on the United States. Yet, uh, given the sorry state of Russian and post-Soviet economy, financial assistance was there as well. And finally, denuclearization of Ukraine, Kazakhstan, that, that comes to an end with Budapest Memorandum. And it is also around that time that the relations become, become uh, much more uh, uh, complicated, tense, and, and, and go, go downhill from there. And uh, uh, my question is whether, whether there was a moment really that in the 1990s somehow somebody could create a foundation on which something else could be built, or Russia, and like any other uh, post-Soviet state, was actually marching to its own drumbeat. And uh, 
Again, at the moment when it was in the Russian national interest, there was a cooperation. And the moment when that wasn't, the cooperation stopped and a different, a different mode was, was uh, introduced. So that's, that's, that's another question. And uh, finally, finally, I uh, want, want to, to uh, um, ask you about the Partnership for Peace. Uh, at least my reading of the book is that you look at partnership of peace as the that uh, alternative that was there that wasn't fully used was sacrificed in the name of the expansion of NATO and uh, uh, if the partnership for peace would would continue probably we would live today in a different world again maybe I'm putting words now into your mouth maybe you're not saying that but that's that's the impression that I am getting. And I, I wonder whether you could actually comment on that more, first of all, whether this reading of, of your, your position is right. And second, what are alternatives of the Poles getting their nuclear weapons if they're not accepted in, in uh, um, NATO? Uh, whether uh, Jasinski was right when he was saying if NATO would not expand, we would not talk today about Ukraine, we would talk about Poland. So again, how, how viable the, the Partnership for Peace was an alternative, whether we can look at it back and say, okay, if only they would stick to that policy, we would be today not just in a different world, we would be in a better world. Uh, again, thanks. There, there is a lot of questions and I'm sure you will not be able to answer all of them, but the good thing is you can choose the ones that you like and comment on those. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Sari. Uh, Mary, would you like to respond? Uh, sure, you're going to give me four or five hours, right, to get back to him on those. Yeah. Um, no. How long? How long or short would you like me to go in response to Sari Christian? A, a few minutes, though. We a few minutes. Will... Only a few minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So, Sari, great questions, and thank you for reading early drafts and improve, improving them greatly. Uh, yeah. On the um, yes. Yeah, so one of the tensions in the book. And I, I really did not expect this, but it became clear as soon as, start, as I started diving into the documents was the future of the former Warsaw Pact state. So Poland, Czechoslovakia, which of course breaks up Hungary versus the future of former Soviet republics, sort of st states in the post-Soviet space. And one of the um, more surprising aspects of my research was to find that President Bill Clinton early on was very focused on the fate of post-Soviet states and particularly Ukraine. He was aware, as you well know, that it was a, a huge state, over 50 million people on the size of Britain or France. It was, of course, born nuclear. It was the third largest nuclear power in the world uh, upon becoming independent because of the amount of the Soviet nuclear arsenal on its territory. It was becoming a democracy. And President Clinton early on would say, uh, paraphrasing, but the exact quotations are in the book, we can't just draw a new line across Europe because we leave Ukraine and these other post-Soviet states in the lurch. People aren't thinking about post-Soviet states. And he even says something to the effect of, uh, you know, there will never be lasting peace in Europe unless we define a, a place for Ukraine. And reading this in my research in 2015, 2016, in the wake of the, the fighting that had broken out in 2014, it just seems so prescient. And so there is this tension where you need to think about the future. If you're in Washington, you're trying to think about the future of Central and Eastern European states, but you're also trying to think about the future of the post-Soviet space. And this actually relates to your question, Serhi, about the partnership for peace, because the solution that Clinton arrives upon with the help of his secretary of defense, uh, secretaries of defense, Les Aspen and Bill Perry, and General John Shalikashvili, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the solution they arrive upon is a, a, um, a modulation to NATO expansion, to the creation of this partnership for peace as a kind of intermediate step. Now, exactly how it relates to NATO expansion is intentionally left vague. There is value in the ambiguity, value in the ambiguity, because it gives Washington the possibility to manage contingency. But roughly speaking, the idea is that the partnership for peace will be the route to joining NATO. It will happen in phases. There's no obvious you know, first place in the waiting line. In the meantime, countries do not immediately receive the Article 5 guarantee. That's this very strong guarantee that an attack on one will be treated as an attack on all. And so 
it offers a berth for Ukraine and other post-Soviet states. And they recognize this and they join it. Now, it's not nearly as sexy as NATO expansion. The Poles are deeply unhappy because they want to be in NATO. But Clinton sends Shali Kashvili, who was born in Poland, to convince the leader of Poland, Lech Walesa, to accept this. They have some fairly tempestuous scenes and fairly interesting documents. Yet Valencia hits the roof, but he comes around and through clenched teeth, the uh, Polish leaders, Czech leaders realize that the West has a point. Clinton literally says to Valencia, Poland of all places should understand the consequences of drawing a line that's going to cut off Ukraine and other post-Soviet states. And so they reach this agreement and Russia even enjoys, agrees to join the Partnership for Peace to join it. So there's, there's, it's on, it's on track. This is not a counterfactual. This is actually policy. This was happening. There was going to be this phased process for expanding NATO, but then for a host of reasons, Clinton changes his mind, and I find that to be a fateful decision. And this touches on another one of your points, uh, Serhi. Uh, I believe there is both agency on the part of Washington and Moscow, as you said. Russia at times its interests aligned with Washington, such as in getting Ukraine denuclearized, but other times it was going its own way. There is this is very much a story of agency on both parts. And another crucial development for the NATO expansion story was Boris Yeltsin's decision to shed the blood of his political opponents in Moscow in 1993 and Chechnya in 1994. You see in this background behind me, I've got the famous picture of uh, Boris Yeltsin during the coup of August 1991, so 30 years ago this year, where he is resisting an attempt, an abortive attempt to try to oust Gorbachev and, 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 and centralize authority again. Yeltsin is at the head of a popular pushback that, that, that causes that coup to fail. But as Serhi has rightly written, he then launches a counter coup of his own, basically pulling Russia out of the Soviet Union, uh, echoing what Ukraine, Ukrainian independence, because that's mainly the way he can get rid of uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. But then he, by 1993, is actually using force, using violence, having tanks fire on his opponents. And then in 1994, he invades Chechnya. And this sends shivers down the spine of Central and Eastern Europeans who start to think, you know, this new Russia is looking a lot like old Russia. And so that decision has a big impact in changing Clinton's mind. And then there's also domestic politics in 1994. In the U.S., that's a midterm congressional election, and the Republicans win a big victory with the contract for America calling for swifter NATO expansion. And so Clinton changes his mind and switches from this diffuse approach that would have provided a birth for Ukraine to an all or nothing, Article 5 or nothing, NATO expansion approach. And now all of a sudden, all the things that he said he didn't want to do, he starts doing, right? It draws a new line across Europe. It alienates Moscow. Secretary of Defense Bill Perry considers resigning. He's so upset. He says, you know, I'm the Secretary of Defense and I have huge respect for Central and Eastern Europe, but my job is to keep the United States safe. And I'm making so much progress in a basically non-proliferation with Russia in nuclear disarmament, in destroying or securing parts of the former Soviet nuclear arsenal. If you, know, you President Clinton, start aggravating Moscow with NATO expansion, it's going to limit my ability to do that. That is not in our interest. And Clinton basically says he doesn't care and he's changing his mind anyway. Perry does not resign, but in 2015, he wrote a memoir saying he wished he had. As he put it in 2015, the results of premature NATO expansion, premature NATO expansion were even worse than I had thought. I wish we had stuck with the partnership for peace. And so in essence, in the book, I'm very much following this thinking of Secretary Perry. So I've just galloped through multiple arguments in the book, but there were great questions, Serhi, and I wanted to touch on some of the key points. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mary. As somebody who chaired the Archives Working Group of the Partnership for Peace, this is, was the most interesting discussion. Um, now, um, we'll go next to um, Heidi Tworek, uh, who is Associate Professor of International History and Public Policy at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. She is a Senior Fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation, as well as a non-resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. Her most recent book is the multi-award winning News from Germany, the competition to control world communications 1900 to 1945, 
She's currently writing about the history and policy of health communications. An article on that project appeared in the American Historical Review in 2019 entitled Communicable Disease, Information, Health and Globalization in the Interwar Period. She received her PhD in history from Harvard and a BA from the University of Cambridge. Heidi, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Washington History Seminar. Zoom room is all yours. Thank you so much. So as I was reading uh, Mary's new book, I was suddenly struck for the reason that I was invited. And surely it's because you had to have someone located in either Vancouver or Vladivostok to talk about this book. So, <laughs> of course, I've taken on the Vancouver role. Um, but I also have to say, as I was uh, reading the book, I was uh, thinking about the trip that I'm taking tomorrow where I'm going to be taking a ferry to one of the islands that's close to Vancouver Island, one called Salt Spring. And one of the most evocative of many, many evocative quotes and episodes in the book, at least for me, is one where Mary writes about the first face-to-face -face meeting between um, Boris Yeltsin and Bill Clinton, who would be calling themselves Boris and Bill uh, before you knew it. And they meet in Vancouver for the symbolism of Vancouver to, to Vladivostok. And they also go to Vancouver Island. And before they go off on a boat, um, Yeltsin uh, happily downs three, I believe it's uh, scotches, before they even get on the boat. So if there's going to be an optioned version of this book, I'm sure that will be one of the first images that the writer will be searching for. I will uh, not be downing three scotches before getting on a boat. Uh, but I think it's just a, one of the many examples of the archival gems that come out of Mary's extraordinarily dogged efforts to uncover documents. And so he has already pointed towards this, but I just wanted to give you one small illustration of, of what this brings out. This is not a dry diplomatic history. Um, this is one that comes alive through people who have beefs with each other, who get on with each other, and how that changes over time and how much that actually changes and transforms this history through the agency of individual human beings who have relationships with each other. And we are only able to get at those because of the many ways in which Mary has pushed for the declassification of documents. And of course, she's already alluded to that, but I think it's incredibly important, particularly at a moment when other scholars like Matt Connolly have been pointing for some years to the great difficulties historians are having with accessing uh, documents, something that I'm sure many of the other people on this call can attest to. So I'd just love for, for Mary, if you could just reflect a little bit more on some of the lessons here for, for other historians and how we should think about this, because I think your book is just a fantastic illustration of how important it actually is to uncover new sources, right? Here we have a history of the 1990s uh, told through NATO expansion that does look very different than if we just had, you know, newspapers and um, readily available sources. So I'd just love to hear you reflect a little bit more on what it is that we need to do as a profession. What do we need the public to be doing? Um, because I think your book is, you know, if you're going to go to Congress and say, here's exhibit A about why we need historians and archives, your book is a great, is a great, great example of that. Um, it's also, I think, an example of a history of the 1990s that's written uh, without triumphalism and without inevitability. Um, you use this idea of a ratchet to say there are certainly many options at this moment, but there's a ratchet whereby with each decision that is made, we turn more and more towards the history that eventually unfolded, but you don't tell it as one that is inevitable. Um, there are choices that are made at, at different moments, and I think that tone is also tremendously important when we write about something that remains so, so fraught and contested uh, today, that it's written in that kind of uh, tone. So I have a couple of um, questions that I wanted to ask you, um, which are maybe just taking a bit more of a, a step back and thinking about the broader lessons that I personally um, drew from this book. Um, so one is that you talked about it as part of a, a trilogy, right, with the, the other two books that you've written, 1989 and The Collapse. And, and I was thinking about these books in conversation with each other, particularly the one that's maybe closest to my heart, which is The Collapse. And I was thinking about how they're actually very different renditions of history in a way. So the collapse tells, you know, this, this story of the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's a short period of time and it makes this argument that it's really mid-level actors who are crucial, right? It's not necessarily the, the Bushes and, and so on. It's really these mid-level actors who are crucial. Um, and yet in, in this book, in Not One Inch, it's a very, it's told over the course of a decade and it's really high-level leaders, right? It's, you know, the Lech Wałęsa's of Poland or it's the, the Gorbachev's, the Yeltsin's and so on. And so this really just led me to the question of trying to think about who is changing what in this period. So is one of the sort of subtle lessons here that 
It's higher level individuals who are changing things over a broader period of time. And it's only in these smaller, discrete moments that mid-level actors change how a particular event unfolds. So in other words, if we're looking at a history of the 1990s in the long run, we're looking at these higher level actors, but let's say we chose another event on the ground in the 1990s, could we again make that argument about mid-level actors? Maybe that's a bit of a political science-y question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it as you think about this as a loose trilogy. You're going to write some article about lessons learned from the loose trilogy. Would that actually be um, one of them about structure and agency? And then the, the final question that I had was just wearing my hat as a historian of international organizations, because I think this book is also a history of international organizations. It's not just a, an international history, it's a history of international organizations as well. Um, and it's, it's one that, in a way, is making a bit of a counter argument to the history that most historians of international organizations would talk about in the 1990s. And that's, of course, the history of peacekeeping and the UN, right? It's the history of that moment of deep utopianism that post the Cold War, the UN is going to be the forum to solve problems. We get that with the first Gulf War. We get it with the agenda for peace in 1992, the reframing of peacekeeping. The UN is going to be the place that will keep peace through the you know, use of troops, et cetera. Um, but then we see how very swiftly from 1994 onwards with um, Rwanda and then with Bosnia, that vision falls apart and, of course, decisively uh, falls apart with the Iraq war in the early 2000s. So another sort of through line of the 1990s is that story of the UN, which is the one that most historians of international organizations would tell. And I think you're offering a bit of a rebuttal to say, well, there's another history of international organizations in the 1990s um, that is also very consequential, and that's the history of NATO. So I guess I'm just wondering if you can you, you talk a little bit, of course, about Bosnia and its influence, and Rwanda shows up a couple of times, but the UN isn't really a big part of the story. So I'm just wondering how we put those two stories together. How do we put um, the optimism about the UN, which also exists in the US, <laughs> and the story about NATO, how do, we, how do we put them into conversation? Um, so as you can see, this book has raised all sorts of really interesting uh, questions for me, from you know, small questions about individual episodes, all the way to, I think, big questions about how we reframe the history of the 1990s uh, and where we put it. So thanks for writing the book, Mary, and uh, I can't wait for it to get into the hands of many of the hundreds of people on the call today. Thank you so much, Heidi, uh, for your very thoughtful comments. Uh, Mary, back to you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you to the audience for turning out in such numbers. It's really, really wonderful as an author, having sat around working on this by myself throughout the pandemic. It's great to finally go out and engage with people on it. No, that's terrific, Heidi. Um, the, uh, let me just grab a few of the points that you've made. Uh, certainly, one aspect of the story that interests me is very much the interaction between structure and agency, right? And um, as anybody who's heard me talk before knows, I, I use the theory of punctuated equilibrium quite often in my writing. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with that, briefly, it comes out of the thinking of evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould. There are also parallels in other fields, but I like Gould's articulation of it. And uh, briefly, Stephen Jay Gould says that when he looks at the fossil record, he does not see a little bit of evolution one day and then a little another day and then a little another day. In other words, he does not see gradualism. Rather, he sees long periods of stasis or equilibrium with relatively little change. And then there's some kind of dramatic event, a punctuational moment, such as an asteroid hitting the earth that is so large, it throws a huge cloud of dust up around the planet. And that cloud of dust is so dense that it lowers the temperature below that at which the dinosaurs who are cold blooded can survive. And so the dinosaurs die out, giving a chance for mammals to come to the fore and thus establishing a new stasis or equilibrium. So in other words, you have these periods where change is, is very small, very limited. And then you have these dramatic moments where a lot of change is possible. And then you have a new stasis or equilibrium. And that's been really helpful to me thinking about this time period, because I feel like this time period at where the wall collapses, where the Soviet Union collapses, that's a punctuational moment. That's a moment where there are, if this is the moment, that's a moment where there are a lot of different timelines to the future that are possible. And so another way of thinking about that is that's a time when contingency starts to come to the fore and actors start to make choices. And gradually as they make choices, they foreclose options for the future. And gradually you get the timeline that we actually have. And then the equilibrium starts to set in again and structure starts to be dominant. So I really like these moments where 
contingency and structure are in dialogue in, in these ordering moments. And I think this is one of them. And so this is where it becomes important, the relationship between Boris and Bill, the bromance, right? Uh, and it really is kind of amazing. The, um, the, as you said, the American side of, on the summits, there were 18 summit meetings between the two. They kept a private running tally of Yeltsin's drinks because after a certain point, you just couldn't get any business done, right? So um, it was clear that, you know, you had to get whatever business done, get done in the morning because by the afternoon or evening, things could go completely haywire. One of the more uh, amusing slash surprising moments was on a visit to Washington uh, the day is done. Yeltsin has gone back to his guest house and suddenly he ends up on the street in just his underwear yelling in Russian that he needs a taxi and a pizza. <laughs> so this is what you're dealing with in Yeltsin. Uh, he is taken back inside and he gets his pizza, but everyone is very relieved when he leaves uh, because it's just he just gets to be so unpredictable. Um, this starts to take on a darker cast later in the relationship between Bill and Boris as the alcohol fueled tirades start to be directed at Bill Clinton. And I trace this in the book, this disintegration in their bromance, how Yeltsin starts hanging up on him, how the bitterness starts to creep in. And a lot of that is over NATO. Uh, at one point, Clinton asks Yeltsin, you know, what are we going to talk about at our next summit? And Yeltsin says, NATO, 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 NATO. He says, you know, Bill, it was so hard for me to turn the faces of my people towards the West. And what you're doing with NATO is destroying that. We, we, you know, we need to address this. And then finally, you get to 1999, where Yeltsin has decided that he's going to give way to Putin. And there's a very dramatic final scene in their final meeting in Istanbul, where Yeltsin says to Clinton, you know, Clinton, you should just give Europe to Russia. Europe has never felt as close to Russia as it, has, as it does, does now. And Clinton responds, I don't think the Europeans would like this very much. And it's just clear this conversation is sort of spiraling out of control. And so these interactions start to as I said, interact with the broader structure of, of, of tension that's growing between Washington and Russia and helps to create the story. And then, yeah, I don't want to go on too long because I know there's more questions to come and I can see questions from the audience popping up in the chat. But what you said, Heidi, about other international organizations is, is absolutely correct. These stories do very much wind together. And if there are budding young historians in the audience, I hope that they'll take up this charge and start to work on the history of the 90s too. Another important history in this period is the history of the expansion of the European Union or lack thereof. That's another part of the story. The European Union is very hesitant to expand. By 1995, it's decided that Russia will never be a member, and uh, it is very reluctant to extend into what internally is referred to as the swamp of Eastern Europe. So it was interesting for me to see a kind, the a kind of um, behind the scenes. Uh, uh, a discussion of Central and Eastern Europe in Western Europe. And so, of course, the European Union, its response to all the dramatic events of 1989 is to let in Austria and a couple other Western countries, right? So for 10 years after the wall comes down, the European Union does not go into Central and Eastern Europe. And so that partly then causes Central and Eastern Europeans to look all the more eagerly at NATO. So these stories do intertwine. And then with the UN, the UN comes in with the violence uh, in, of course, Bosnia and Kosovo. And there's an important precursor when the United States decides to go ahead without UN Security Council approval. And that starts to show the you know, relative weights of NATO and the UN in America's mind. So yes, these institutional stories very much blend together and there's a lot more work to be done on all of them. Thank you, Mary. We have... Uh not just a sizable, but also a formidable audience. And so let me remind <laughs> everyone uh, that you can join the conversation in three ways. You can, our preference, uh, use the raise hand function to um, get into the queue um, to personally ask your question, or you can post your comment, your question uh, to the Q&A um, uh, functionality and we'll po um, post the question to Mary and the other panelists. Uh, or you can email Rachel Wheatley at rweatley at historians.org and get your question across that way. We will get to now to our third commentator. Um, we passed her briefly because she had the, the uh, trash truck um, pull up on <laughs> her house. So uh, I hope the, um, uh, the trash truck is gone and we can uh, uh, hear you now. Um, 
uh, loud and clear, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer Siegel is the newly minted, I think, Bruce Cunningham Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University Sanford School of Public Policy, having taught for 18 years at the Department of History at The Ohio State University. She received her PhD from Yale University in 1998. She specializes in modern European diplomatic and military history with a focus on the British and Russian empires. She is the author of For Peace and Money, French and British Finance in the Service of Tsars and Commissars, and Endgame, Britain, Russia, and the Final Struggle for Central Asia, which won the 2003 AAA S Barbara Yelavich Prize. She has published articles on intelligence history and co-edited Intelligence and Statecraft, the Use and Limits of Intelligence in International Society. Her current work uh, research projects include an exploration of the diplomacy of the First World War and a project on the Rothschilds and early Russian oil industry. Jennifer, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Washington History Seminar. Zoom room is all yours. Thank you so much. I, of course, would like to start by thanking uh, the Washington History Seminar for giving me the opportunity to read this book before it hits the, the featured books tables at every bookstore nation and worldwide, which I'm sure will it be its destination. And of course, to comment on a few small aspects of this, this monumental work. Uh, I would particularly like to thank Mary for persevering in the, the prodigious research and writing project that is manifested in this, this opus. It's the only word that I can, that I can use for this. Uh, as Mary told us, of course, the supply chain crisis has meant that, that only a very privileged few have had the chance to delve into and really luxuriate in what I, and it seems my colleagues here uh, on this panel feel is, is their personal favorite, which is of course, the, uh, the citations. Um, I, I disagree with Mary. Everyone should be reading the citations. They should not be optional because they are, uh, it's, it's truly a, a who's who of, no, no, actually it's a where's where of archival holdings stretching across Europe, the United States, and of course also I think encouraged uh, by the pandemic, but in, in this digital moment, of course, the, the archival holdings that are available online as well, uh, it is a, a treasure trove. Um, and I know that this book has been a long lived labor of love for Mary, uh, but I, I do wanna stress that this labor was absolutely not in, in vain. Um, now, of course, what, it's, what is clear uh, in this book and what's, been what is clear from what we have been hearing thus far about Mary's take on what she evocatively calls in her introduction, uh, the unruly history of the 90s. Uh, what's clear is that this is a case of continual misperceptions, uh, missteps, misunderstandings, and missed opportunities. Uh, as the relationship between the United States and the Russian Federation devolved into a much more antagonistic relationship, a relationship that much more closely resembled the Cold War than it did that rosy relationship that, that supposedly had been birthed in 1991. In all honesty, at the time, uh, I felt living for long stretches in Moscow and in St. Petersburg in the middle of the 1990s. Uh, while I was doing my dissertation research, I felt that what was being sold in and by the West, such as it was, was an, an overly optimistic picture of, I don't know, a connubial bliss um, between one seasoned diplomatic uh, democratic power uh, and one democratic ingenue, this new Russian state and government. And as Mary makes clear in this book, a lack of appreciation for, for just how tenuous and how challenging this relationship was uh, and a lack of appreciation for what I might call the official mind of the Russia of Yeltsin and Putin, uh, that, that this lack of appreciation led Washington to fail 
in striking the necessary balance between the agency and agendas of the post-Cold War Central and East European states on the one hand, and the agency uh, ambitions uh, and security concerns, the very real security concerns of the post-Cold War Russian state on the other. And, And this raises for me a question on which I would love to get uh, your further take, Mary. Uh, I have long been plagued by a, a somewhat nagging question, which came up again and again, or was 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 underscored again and again as I was reading your book. Um, how was it that the United States government and the United States Russia experts could get Russia and its leadership? so wrong in this period, after they had spent the previous 45 plus years with Russia in the form of the Soviet Union, with Russia as the primary focus of their foreign and security policy. How did they get Russia so long? Why did they get those those basic assumptions about post-Soviet Russia that you refer to wrong? Were the fault lines lying on on this front in Moscow, or were the fault lines in Foggy Bottom, Pentagon, Langley, why were they getting it so wrong? Now, and additionally, we might wonder, those are where the the most visible fault lines uh, might have been, but we also might wonder, or I wonder, where, uh, if there were uh, also key fault lines running through the U.S. Department of the Treasury, Uh, And I particularly appreciated reading in Mary's book a a recognition of the importance of longstanding economic and financial concerns tied into Russia's security stance in this post-Cold War era. Uh, Building on Adam Tooze's emphasis on the connection between trade and security policy, Mary reminds us in this book of the importance of international financial considerations, a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And I would be remiss given my interests uh, and and Mary would be quite surprised if I was not going to ask some questions and also highlight her brief but really crucial discussion of the, the primacy of debt concerns in the extension of international tensions for Russia in those those early post-Soviet years. Mary, correctly emphasizes the, um, I won't say struggle, but the the disagreements that existed within the Bush administration as aid to Russia was being contemplated in early 1992, these disagreements over the question of the, the fate of the approximately $65 billion of extant Soviet debt. Uh, James Baker at State, felt that the Soviet debt question should not be pushed, uh, that that debt should possibly be forgiven. And Nicholas Brady at Treasury argued the reverse and won the policy battle. Uh, He he and and Treasury used the example of the Bolshevik repudiation of Tsar's debt after the 1917 revolution as a model of how a new regime should not proceed if they wanted to make friends and influence people, if they wanted to ingratiate themselves within the international community. Um, Mary leaves open in this book, she leaves open the question of how some modicum of debt forgiveness might have made the path easier for the successor state to the Soviet Union. Uh, This is clearly one of the many missed opportunities that she highlights in the book. Um, Personally, I think that Brady and his cohort missed the point. The biggest problem with the 1917 debt repudiation arose not from the fact that the Bolsheviks did not pay the Tsar's debt, but from the fact that the West expected them to pay the Tsar's debt and continued to expect them to pay the Tsar's debt. And in turn, they isolated the new state from the international community. I think that's the the model, but of course, that's really a discussion of another book, not not this one. Um, Now, this This 1992 episode raises some questions that I would love to pose before I cede the floor. Um, What's clearly visible 
in Mary's telling of this debt debate story is a, a territorial battle for influence between cabinet secretaries, between Baker and Brady, and between their departments, between state and treasury. In some ways, this is, I think, much more of a, an, an inside the beltway fight uh, than it is anything about what's going on inside the walls of the Kremlin. Uh, and I'd love to hear Mary's thoughts, both in reference to the specific case of post-Cold War Soviet debt and, uh, uh, and the dipl diplomacy around that debt. But also, I'd be interested to know, Mary, if you want to take the time to talk about it now, uh, what you think in relation to international relations in general. I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether financial diplomacy should be the purview of foreign ministries or of finance ministries. Who, who should control policy when money is involved? Now, this is, again, a question that's close to my own work. Um, and selfishly, I would love to hear your opinion. And of course, I have many more thoughts and questions and ideas that are inspired by this extremely, extremely rich book. Questions about the extent of Russian agency, uh, questions about accessing the Russian governmental mindset, um, more questions like that. But of course, there's nothing worse than a commentator who sucks up time when there are all sorts of people in the audience chomping at the bit to get at the author. So I will just end by thanking our conveners and my fellow panelists, and of course, Mary, for the uh, time and the opportunity that I have had here today. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Greatly appreciated your thoughtful comments. Mary, some quick rejoinders okay. and then we'll have some questions from Yeah, you. absolutely. Yeah. The, um, yeah, this, this is a big question, is how did the relationship with Russia go so wrong? And I, in the book, I, I use uh, two anecdotes to illustrate the arc from cooperation to the new bitterness that we have now. I talk about how in 1991, as the Soviet Union is collapsing, uh, George H.W. Bush and James Baker are very concerned about its consequences for the Soviet nuclear arsenal. Because, of course, as we've been, as I've been mentioning, the, the Soviet Union, of course, has a strategic nuclear arsenal capable of ending most life on Earth. And the fact that it was disintegrating obviously was a source of great concern. And so Baker pretty much drops everything in December 1991, so 30 years ago now, and goes to Moscow and basically more or less just flat out asks Yeltsin, to tell him how nuclear command and control works in detail. In other words, how would you launch weapons? This is usually one of the most closely held secrets of state, but Yeltsin complies. Now that's partly because he's trying to curry favor with Washington to outmaneuver Gorbachev, but it also shows the kind of level of trust that existed. And so I have these remarkable notes from Baker where Baker is clearly writing down as fast as he can all of the components that would be involved if Moscow were to launch a nuclear weapon. So you've got that level of cooperation that then disintegrates by 1999 when Putin is coming into power into very different scenes. I talk about a scene where Strobe Talbot, the main Russia advisor for Clinton, is talking to Putin, to a grim-faced Putin, and it's clear nothing is going to happen on the level of nuclear secrets being exchanged. Instead, Putin is complaining about how Soviet pullback from Central and Eastern Europe and Soviet collapse created lawlessness. And now in these regions where there used to be order, now terrorists play soccer with the decapitated heads of hostages. Now this of course is a self-serving comment by Putin because he wants to portray himself as the strong man who can come in and take care of this. But it does show you kind of this arc and you do see all these misperceptions along the way as you rightly pointed out, Jennifer, there's this this sense at the beginning somehow that it in, in uh, Moscow, that this newfound cooperation between Moscow and Washington will be Washington's highest priority. And then this debt issue is there is so shocking for that reason. And this is one of the few fights that Secretary of State James Baker loses, by the way, inside the Bush administration, as you rightly said, he loses to Brady, who insists on repayment of debts. Meanwhile, Baker is trying to you know, argue against that. Uh, there's a, a newspaper clipping from the time, actually, from Russia expert Stephen Sistanovich. He wrote in 1993 in the New York Times that while real doubts could be raised about all the many alternatives being proposed to help Russia, so forgiving debt and so forth, these doubts are nothing compared with the frustration and powerlessness we will feel once Russian democracy fails. 
And I think that's a very prescient comment. And because of the lack of flexibility on debt issue and so forth, you, you know, start a sequence of events that does hurt Russia, a nascent Russian democracy at a time when it is in need of friends. Again, I'm trying to, this is not a book that blames Washington, nor is it a triumphalist account. Rather, I try to show how American and Russian choices combined in tragic ways in a cumulative fashion to accumulate scar tissue. And and basically um, end this moment of optimism. And the fight over the debt that you've identified is very much part of that fight. There's a lot more I could say, but I, 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 I am overwhelmed by a wave of questions and I feel like we should probably go to them. I'm not, and I understand they're on email too. So I'm not quite sure which ones you want me to answer. Eric or Christian, are you oh, going to tee them up? I will let you know which ones to okay, answer. Okay, all right, right, excellent, all right. Uh, um, and we'll first go to Joan Hoff. Joan Hoff, if you could please unmute yourself. Welcome back to the Washington History Seminar. No, nope, we're going to Joan Hoff. Joan Hoff first. Joan, please unmute yourself. Joan, we can't hear you, so unless, we'll try you back. Um, in the meantime, we'll go to William Hill. William Hill, please unmute yourself. There we go. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Now you're muted again. Please unmute yourself. We can't hear you. There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, okay, thanks for and you're You're muted again. Is there uh, some kind of control from the, the host I, that needs to unmute? Okay, I think we're good. Go ahead. Um, all right, uh, there, the technology is... Um... Someone muted me again. I, I should be on now. It, it shows that I'm... And let me just, uh, you know, ask... Well, um, there's so much that I want to ask, but I, um, I one thing, um, in, in looking at the um, all of these materials, the new materials you've gone through, did you get any sense about, um, you know, the Russians looking not only at the size of NATO, the expense, you know, the, the countries that um, it um, expanded to, but uh, the change in the nature of NATO and its behavior. I, I mean, in 1992, um, at the end, by the time the Cold War has ended, NATO has never fought a battle. NATO troops have never left NATO countries, but gradually goes out of area with first peace enforcement, peacekeeping in Bosnia, uh, war fighting in you know, Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo by the end of that decade, uh, then to Afghanistan and an international expeditionary capability uh, by the, uh, you know, by the mid 2000s. Uh, and, and in what sense, do you get any sense that this played any particular role in Russian perceptions of NATO and of the threat or the danger that NATO posed to them. Thank you, Mary. Great. So I'm assuming this is William Hill, author of the wonderful book, No Place for Russia, European Security and Institutions Since 1989. So after you buy my book, if you haven't already got that book, and why not, make sure you buy William Hill's fantastic book. And then you should also order my friend Vlad Vlad Zubak's book on the collapse, uh, which is a great detailed account of 1991, uh, an excellent companion to Sergei's book. So yes, so um, yeah, the um, we'll be happy to talk to you more about this. Uh, that is a, an excellent point. So in other words, what's the impact not just of 
not just of NATO expanding geographically, but changing how it behaves. And yes, absolutely, that is a theme in the book. I also discussed this in my recent, recent foreign affairs article, which might be of interest to people in the audience. It's in the current November, December issue. Briefly, in the article, I talk about what I've nicknamed the Scandinavian strategy, the Scandinavian strategy. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, in at the time of the founding in 1949, the only original state with a border with the Soviet Union was Norway. And uh, so Norway, conscious of that unique status, negotiated basically conditions to its memberships, to its membership to keep long-term frictions with Moscow manageable. In other words, uh, it, it, NATO agreed that there would be no nuclear weapons on Norway's territory or in its ports, and there would be no foreign troops based there during peacetime. In essence, this was a recognition of the fact that the closer the alliance moved to Moscow, the, um, the greater the chance of frictions with Moscow would result. The way I put it in the book is the cost per inch of expansion goes up the closer you get to Moscow. Now, the reason I mention this is that Norway was basically living in a neighborhood that was Soviet adjacent, but not Soviet controlled. And it could have been a model for Central and Eastern Europe. Central and Eastern European countries could have been treated as Norway um, and Denmark and Iceland and other places that had um, special memberships. Now, before I get a flood of email, I realize there's a debate over whether Norway is Scandinavian or Nordic, but I decided to go with the alliteration of Scandinavian strategy. So because NATO in the past had de facto allowed these kind of contingencies and memberships, that seemed to me like that could have been an option for Central and Eastern Europe. And the Bill Clinton administration, and Strobe Talbot is the lead point person on many of these issues, initially thinks about doing something like that, but eventually comes around to the decision that, uh, there, as they put it, there will be no second-class security guarantees. Either a country gets, it's all or nothing. It gets Article 5 or nothing. In other words, they're denying that the cost per inch is more it goes up as the alliance moves towards Moscow. So, so in that sense, William, to get to your question, NATO is changing its behavior where it previously had the Scandinavian solution, which I think would have been useful, especially for places like the Baltics, which are now like Norway was in a neighborhood that is Russia adjacent, but not Russia controlled. Uh, the Clinton administration decides not to follow that precedent. And so that's a change in how expansion is happening from before. Not, so it's, that's not just, in other words, as you wisely point out, William, it's not just that NATO is expanding, but it's also how it's expanding. That really is the theme of the book. So thanks for the terrific question. Uh, reach out to me. I'd love to be in touch with you on more of those details. Thank you. Thank you. Let's try Joan Huff again. Joan, if you could please unmute yourself. Joan Huff. If while we're trying to get Joan online, let me post a question um, by Svetlana Savranskaya. Uh, could you, Mary, please speak more about jo George H.W. Bush's determination to expand NATO? It was mentioned in Siri's remarks, specifically determination to expand rather than just keep and strengthen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svetlana. Of course, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the fantastic work of Tom Blatton and Svetlana Savranskaya at the National Security Archive, uh, what's wrong with you? Their work is absolutely foundational for research in this period, and, and uh, the sheer amount of documents they've gotten declassified is just amazing. And I was happy to contribute to their collections with the things I was able to get from the Clinton Library. Oh, and also actually circling back to Heidi's question about declassification successes, uh, Tom and Svetlana are really masters who show how it, it how it's done. And so for students in the audience who are listening and interested in that, either reach out to me directly or to Tom and Svetlana, we can give you some tips on getting things declassified. Yeah, so um, yeah, so Serhi, of course, very, um, very uh, wisely picked up on an important part of the book. I realized in looking at this story, which is, I've said, I've looked at it before, right? I mean, I've done two other books about this. I, but I, this time I looked at it from a new angle, right? In the past, I was looking at it from the point of view of, of the, the 
um, as Heidi talked about, the dissidents who are trying to bring the wall down or the border guards or Stasi agents who are there. I also looked at it at the point of view from the Germans who are trying to unify their country. But here, when I looked at this through a different lens, so I'm looking at it through the lens of NATO and the organization, I realized what was really crucial, and Svetlana, you've identified this, was that Bush wanted not only to maintain NATO as the main security organization in the post-Cold War world, but also to maintain its ability to expand. That may seem like a small point, but I realized how important that was in the course of the research, because there were discussions about keeping NATO without expansion. And that's actually the heart of this controversy over the not one inch comment. Uh, James Baker, when he made that comment to Mikhail Gorbachev, was somewhat out of the loop with the thinking of his boss, the president, because he'd been on an extended trip. And he was thinking along the lines of uh, exchanging as he said to Mikhail Gorbachev, how about you let your part of Germany go and we agree NATO moves not one inch eastward. Again, this is hypothetical. The way it, he, there's nothing in writing, but this is the, the, along the lines of what they're discussing. The problem is that would leave divided Germany half in and half out of NATO, which is something President Bush and um, Brent Scowcroft have realized. And they're thinking more along the lines of the Scandinavian strategy that I mentioned earlier. In other words, we are going to keep moving eastward, but recognizing that the cost per inch of expansion goes up the closer you get to Moscow, we're going to offer special concessions as we move on to Eastern German territory. And the end result of that, rather interestingly, is that the territory of former East Germany is now the only part of Europe that is guaranteed by treaty to be a nuclear free zone because that was the concession that the West ends up making to allow NATO to move eastward across the Cold War line. And it gets Moscow to agree to that. The, the, the treaty, the final settlement on Germany, includes language that explicitly allows NATO to move eastward across the Cold War line, in other words, to keep expanding, and Moscow signs that. So what exists in writing is signed by Moscow, and it allows this expansion. Uh, uh, Baker realizes it very quickly that he's, he's uh, out of line, and he immediately writes back to allies after this trip quietly to say, I realize what I said is causing some confusion. We're going to have to roll that back. We're going to walk that back. It takes Moscow a while to notice. And then, of course, when it does, you get the famous controversy that we have to this day. But the key part is, is, is Svetlana has identified not only keeping NATO, but keeping its ability to expand. And that's what then opens the door to everything that follows. And I talk in the book about three critical decisions, one under George H.W. Bush and then two under President Clinton. And so that is the first critical decision under George H.W. Bush. Foreclosing other options, post-Cold War security will continue to be based on a NATO that can expand. So that's the first critical decision. And then the next decisions fall to Clinton. Clinton has to decide how to expand NATO and how far. And initially, as I talked about in response to Sergei's comments, there is what I think is a, is a, is a smart idea of, of the Partnership for Peace, which is this diffuse manner of expansion that is not popular, but acceptable to all the players involved. But then Clinton decides, he makes a third and final decision, decides, no, I'm not going to do that. We're going to do all or nothing, Article 5 expansion. And that sets us on the path that we're on today. So thank you, Svetlana, for a typically insightful question. Great. Another question. Yep. Uh, I'm from, actually two, from Lucian Kim, who's yep. uh, uh, currently a fellow at the Wilson Center, and okay. most recently NPR's Moscow Borough Chief. Ah. Uh, first one you just addressed, actually, based on your research and the title of your book, Can One Say a Promise Was Made to Gorbachev and One Still Hears in Russia on NATO Eastward Expansion or Not? But secondly, given Angela Merkel's reluctance to support NATO, NATO membership for countries such as Ukraine and Georgia, what can you tell us about the role a newly reunified Germany's uh, role in pushing uh, a newly reunified Germany's role in pushing eastward expansion? Um, sentence, the, the oh, sentence. I'm, I'm a little, little confused because I'm, I think you I'm, got okay. So what can you tell us about the role of a newly reunified Germany in pushing for eastward expansion? 
Okay, well, uh, Lucy and Kim, I learned so much from your reporting from Moscow. I love that feature on your dacha, the, somewhere in the dacha. If people Google it, Lucy and Kim, dacha, August, it's a great feature. Um, you'll enjoy it. Uh, so thank you for making time to come today. Yeah, so on the debate over was there a promise, I, I, I've written quite a bit about this. And um, uh, I, I, if you email me at sarati at jhu.edu, I can send you some information on that. Briefly, um, there, as, as many people here know and in the audience know, there's this controversy uh, over whether or not there was a formal promise not to expand NATO and opinions run the gamut. So you have, you know, on the one hand, you have Americans saying it absolutely never came up. This is totally a myth. It's totally ridiculous. And on the other hand, you have Russians saying we absolutely were betrayed, uh, 100% a slam dunk case. And unsurprisingly, when you dive into the evidence, the evidence shows that what happened was somewhere in between. So there certainly was discussion about the role of NATO in Central and Eastern Europe at a very early date. Mikhail Gorbachev himself was aware of this. This issue is partly complicated because Mikhail Gorbachev in 2014 gave an interview where he said things like, um, NATO expansion never came up, no one ever raised it. Even after the Warsaw Pact collapsed, uh, no one ever brought it up. So you have Mikhail Gorbachev giving this interview, which gets widely cited, saying it never came up. But this is why it's so useful to work from the original sources. When you actually get back into the original sources, even Gorbachev's own notes, his own personal records contain statements like the following from May 1990. I told Secretary of State James Baker, we are aware of your favorable attitude toward the intention expressed by a number of representatives of East European countries to withdraw from the Warsaw Pact in order to join NATO later. So already in um, 1990, you have Gorbachev talking about that. And already in November 1989, you have Bush and Thatcher talking about NATO and Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Thatcher talking about keeping the Warsaw Pact as a fig leaf for Gorbachev. So you certainly have the issue coming up. I can document that multiple ways. Uh, what you do not have is a formal written promise not to expand NATO. And in fact, what does exist in writing, as I just mentioned before, explicitly allows NATO to expand eastward over the Cold War line and Moscow signed it. So it, the, this question really comes down to what do you understand by a promise? So my standard is something that is written and there is nothing that is written that promises that NATO will not expand. In fact, what is written actually guarantees exactly the opposite. But the issue certainly does come up and it certainly is discussed in hypothetical ways. Uh, and then on the second part of the question, I'm just a little confused because Angela Merkel, of course, is the still current leader versus newly unified Germany that would have been um, 1990. So I'm not quite sure if you're asking me to address historically or in current terms uh, the status of uh, Germany in these debates. Certainly, though, this um, either way, it, it comes back in many ways to Ukraine. There were a lot of surprises for me in writing this book, right? Because I'm starting off working on this book, which I'm thinking is going to be focused on Central and Eastern Europe. But as I started working on it, as I said, it turned out Ukraine was so central to President Clinton's thinking. So I realized I needed to know a lot more about Ukraine. And I was so grateful to Serhi for sharing his expertise on that. And then it turns out the invasion of Chechnya was hugely significant. And uh, there's also a huge Baltic um, Finnish Scandinavian angle as well. So it just became a very, very big story. And so it's clear that this issue of providing a birth for Ukraine, because we in the United States decided to give up on the Partnership for Peace solution, we turned it into a long-term issue because we didn't find a resolution for Ukraine in this post-Cold War moment. And I think as Sarah, he rightly says, I think in some ways you can frame this whole period as a debate about what happens to states in the post-Soviet space. And so since we didn't define a birth for Ukraine, that became an ongoing issue. And then of course, Angela Merkel comes into office and of course becomes very active in trying to deal with that issue once it turns into bloodshed there. So uh, we're beyond this punctuational moment. I think we're now in a new stasis or equilibrium where dramatic changes are not really possible. So I agree very much with Angela Merkel's efforts to at least keep to the greatest extent possible, keep what's going on in Ukraine, at least to a level of minimum violence and try to find negotiated rather than violent solutions. But the fact that this is an ongoing issue, I think comes out of the decisions made in the 1990s.
Thank you. Let's try. We're having problems with the technology today, but let's try Jeff Hahn. Uh, if you could unmute yourself for a very short question, a final short answer from Mary, and then we'll have to bring this to an end. Jeff. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, very excited to read the book. Thank you. I'm actually writing my dissertation on the 1990s. So I'm one of the young scholars you keep referring to. I hope we can speak more in more detail later. I just had a quick question on the 1993 crisis. You describe how the 93 crisis and the subsequent 94 Chechen war uh, presented the new Russia as kind of behaving in a similar manner to the old Russia. And, and in fact, I do agree with you in that. But I'm curious, it seems to me from my own research that Yeltsin actively sought to cultivate international support for his 90, 1993 uh, putsch against the parliament. And it, throughout that was fully supported by Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and the United States. In fact, I think the People's Republic of China was the only country not to come out fully in favor of Yeltsin, instead just taking a neutral tack. Um, so I'm curious why you, why you think, uh, or why do you think that the US after the 93 crisis began to see Russia as more unreliable and more threatening? Thank you. Mary? Yeah, so this is, um, yeah, the 1993 events, uh, and it, it's unfortunately there's too little time left for me to go into them, but they were very confusing. Uh, there was an interesting conversation between Bill Clinton and Helmut Kohl about the 1993 events, which end up with, Putin, uh, with Yeltsin shedding the blood of his opponents. And Clinton says to, to Chancellor Kohl, and remember, these are leaders of states with huge intelligence gathering agencies. Clinton says to Cole, can you figure out what's going on over there? And Cole says, none of us can figure out what's going on over there. But we figure we trust Yeltsin more than anybody else. So we probably have to back him. So there's a gap between um, public either expressions of support or at least tolerant silence and the internal discussion. And the internal discussion starts to get starts to um, become worried uh, in 93. And then in 94, the invasion of Chechnya, the internal private discussion is really damning in the West, uh, saying, you know, this is really a, a very bad move, self-inflicted wound. It shows that Russia is still willing to use violence. So what's really going on is this sort of internal reassessment of the degree to which Russia has changed. It doesn't really come out so much in public. In fact, there are public statements of support but internally, it starts to change people's minds. And certainly Central and Eastern Europeans say, look, today, Chechnya, tomorrow, our capitals, we need Article 5. So this is more of an internal discussion. And that's one of the another interesting aspect of getting these documents to classify, because you can see times like this where the public discussion differs from the internal discussion. Thank you so much for the succinct uh, response. With that, I'm afraid... Uh, we will have to bring this discussion to a close with apologies to all of those we couldn't call on, including those where the technology failed us today. But um, uh, so it is. Um, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Heidi, Jennifer and Sari for a really wonderful discussion. With that, I'll turn it back over to Eric. Eric. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I think we probably could go on for another hour, but alas, we cannot. So let me simply join you, uh, invite you to join us uh, next Monday uh, on November 15th at 4 p.m. when we return to discuss Kate Clifford Larson's Walk With Me, a biography of Fannie Lou Hamer. And with that, we say good night and take care.